Hi, it's Brendan McGrath from the NTSP. I just want to explain a few extra things about these things. One-way valves, often known as speaking valves or by the commonest brand name, which is the Passimure one-way valve. So one-way valves are really useful for patients with tracheostomies. The way they work is when you breathe in, the one-way valve is open and the patient can breathe in through the tracheostomy tube into their lungs. When the patient breathes out, the one-way valve closes, which means you cannot breathe out via the tracheostomy tube and therefore out through the neck into either a breathing circuit or just into the open room. Gas has to go past the tracheostomy tube, which is sitting in the windpipe. That means that the gas, when you breathe out, is forced out through your nose and mouth and promotes speech. That means that these valves can only be used with tracheostomy tubes that either do not have a cuff or that the cuff has been deflated. If the cuff is inflated, then the patient cannot breathe out. That means that they'll asphyxiate if you use a one-way valve with a tracheostomy tube where the cuff is inflated. In all situations, there's got to be enough space around the tracheostomy tube for the expired gas to move past the tube and out through the mouth. That means that the patient has to have the right size tracheostomy tube because a big tube in a relatively small trachea, even without a cuff, might mean there's not enough space for the gas to escape. You also need to have a relatively normal upper airway, which as we know in intensive care is not always the case and can also be the case in some surgical conditions that lead to tracheostomy. These one-way valves are really useful, particularly in patients who are starting with a new tracheostomy and we're embarking on that journey of laryngeal rehabilitation. They're not just there for speaking. If you think about all the things that we do when you've not got a tracheostomy that involve closing your glottis uh, and forcibly expiring against it, things like going to the toilet, things like bracing yourselves to stand up or to lift heavy weights, they're all really important. And so these valves are really important to our patients for lots of things, mobilisation, daily bodily functions, and of course, vocalisation. They can also help with controlling of breathing, with that respiratory and laryngeal rehabilitation, and eating and drinking. So there's lots of reasons to use them early in the patient's recovery. Lots of patients who need a tracheostomy long-term will use valves like this when they're out and about, and it becomes part of normal daily life. But when we're using them in an intensive care setting, we're often using them in patients with tracheostomies that still have cuffs. And they need the cuff often because they're still quite dependent on the ventilator. That introduces a layer of risk that we need to be really careful about. So tracheostomy tubes are perfectly safe to use with these one-way valves, but you've got to take the cuff down and make sure it's completely deflated because any obstruction to the expired airflow will make using these valves really difficult. There's a number of checks that we need to go through before we start using these one-way valves. The first thing we need to check is whether the patient has a patent upper airway. Sometimes we'll know this from previous examinations with uh, cameras or if the patient's been to theatre. If a patient has been in intensive care for a number of days or weeks, particularly if they've spent time with an oral translaryngeal uh, tracheal tube, then the upper airway might be compromised. That means swollen or damaged. If there's any doubt, we need to have a look with an endoscope. A simple bedside screen involves deflating the cuff while the patient is still attached to a ventilator or ventilator free and getting them to try and breathe. What you'll see is airflow hopefully coming out through the mouth and you can feel that on your gloved hand or you can listen for it either with a stethoscope or just by listening close to where the patient's breathing out. You don't want to hear any inspiratory or expiratory noises such as stridor which would indicate a significant narrowing of the upper airway. Ideally the patient might whisper or even start to talk and all these things indicate a functioning larynx and no obstruction to airflow. If there's any doubts about the patency of the airway, we need to check. And we can do that with an endoscope 
organised either by our speech and language therapy colleagues or by asking ENT or anyone who knows their way around upper airway anatomy. Moving towards deflating the cuff requires a number of things to be in place. The patient needs to be strong enough from a respiratory point of view to tolerate reducing the ventilation pressures that occur when you deflate the cuff. If you think about it, the ventilator is delivering gas into the lungs like a bicycle pump. And we've got a very clear seal onto the bike pump when the tracheostomy tube balloon is inflated. There's a seal there. So all the gas from the ventilator goes into the lungs. If we deflate the cuff, some of the gas that the ventilator blows in will escape up through the upper airways. Usually this is good, but we need a few things to be in place before we can do this safely. Because not as much gas is going to the lungs, that means that the patient won't get the same level of ventilatory support that they had with the cuff inflated. So the patient needs to be well enough to tolerate this. Typically that's someone on modest airway pressures, ideally breathing by themselves, and someone who's not requiring more than about 50% oxygen, although this will be an individual decision for the clinicians involved. When you deflate the cuff, the patient can no longer uh, has that protection uh, that the cuff might afford to aspiration. Now typically when patients are awake, and if you deflate the cuff, we've got some gas constantly coming out through their upper airway, that's not such a problem. But before you deflate the cuff, make sure you've cleared any secretions either in the mouth, at the back of the throat, or sitting above the cuff with subglottic suction. Warn the patient that they're likely to cough, particularly if the larynx hasn't been stimulated for a long time. Coughing is usually good and can signify a return to that laryngeal sensation that we want. And every time the patient coughs, that's training for their larynx as they begin this journey of rehabilitation. So don't worry too much about coughing. Reassure the patient. You also need to use a ventilator or a ventilator mode that will tolerate the leaks that we generate by cuff deflation. Some of the gas will escape out through the upper airway. So the ventilator delivers a volume of gas and it doesn't get the same amount back because some of it's escaped. The amount that escapes depends on the patient's breathing pattern and the resistance in their lungs and the type of ventilator, the type of ventilatory mode. But you'll certainly get less back than you deliver. So for some standard ICU ventilators, they won't like that and they'll alarm. So you typically need a non-invasive ventilatory mode or non-invasive ventilator that's used to coping with big leaks. You'll expect to see a change in the capnography trace, again depending on where exactly your capnograph is in the ventilator circuit. You will also expect to see a reduction in the tidal volumes for the reasons that we've just discussed. You might have to adjust your ventilator alarms. And all this is before we've got anywhere near the one-way valve. The patient is likely to be anxious, and so you would expect the heart rate or sometimes the breathing rate to increase. Because we've reduced the ventilatory support, you might see this manifest as an increased work of breathing as well. So you want the patient to be cardiovascularly stable and the respiratory rate to be typically less than 30. But all this is dependent on the patient's situation. Once the patient is tolerating cuff deflation, we can move to a simple screening test to see whether the patient will tolerate a one-way speaking valve. Simple occlusion of the tracheostomy tube with a glove finger will indicate whether the patient can breathe adequately through their upper airway. Remember that this will be unusual for a patient, particularly if it's the first time, and particularly if you've just disconnected them from the ventilator to try this finger occlusion test. So it might not be completely smooth, but what you're looking for is evidence that they can breathe through their upper airway. So vocalisation or comfort taking breaths in and out. You want to see this ideally for around 15 seconds to make sure that the patient's taken a few breaths and that their upper airway is patent. Remember to put them back onto the ventilator if you've disconnected the ventilator for this finger occlusion test. There are a number of reasons to not use a one-way speaking valve. Clearly that's in a patient who will not tolerate cuff deflation because you cannot use one of these if the cuff is inflated. If the patient fails their airway assessment or needs further investigation, don't use a speaking valve until you're sure they've got a patent airway. 
This applies to some surgical tracheostomies, so it's worth checking with the surgical team who perform the tracheostomy whether the patient's ready to try a one-way speaking valve. The speech and language therapists are another invaluable resource when you're trying to plan when to use a speaking valve. We don't normally use a one-way valve in the first few days following a tracheostomy, perhaps up to 48 hours following establishment of a stoma. You don't want to use a valve if there's a parastomal air leak. That means air escaping alongside or beside the tracheostomy tube. You also wouldn't use a speaking valve if the patient's got lots of bleeding from the tracheostomy or from the stoma. You want a stable patient with no current issues with the tracheostomy tube or the stoma. Using the valve is quite straightforward and we've got a number of videos that explain how to do this. There's also some great resources on the Passy Muir website, the company that make some of the common speaking valves that we use. There's a certain way to insert these valves into a ventilator circuit and our videos and photographs will show you how to do this. Clearly it's critical that if the patient has a cuffed tracheostomy tube that this is deflated prior to using a speaking valve. What's even more important is that you tell any staff around what's going on. Because the patient might be using this valve for minutes or hours. And if the staff at the bedside go on their break or get called away, it's important that anyone else who will attend that patient knows that there's a one-way speaking valve in the circuit. These valves add expiratory resistance to the airflow. That means that a patient, when they start using them, will find it hard work. This is on top of any increase in the work of breathing that we may have caused by deflating the cuff. So expect to see the respiratory rate go up, perhaps the oxygen saturations drop, and maybe the vital signs change to indicate a degree of increased work of breathing. That's okay for a little bit, but often patients need to start small and build up the duration of time that they're using speaking valves for. If a patient becomes distressed, wearing a speaking valve, remove it. And clearly, if there's a speaking valve in place, you cannot inflate the cuff. It's really important to document that you've checked the airway and that it's appropriate to use a speaking valve. It's also useful to know when you started to use a valve and how long that episode lasted for. Record in the notes if there were any problems or any successes, so that next time the person facilitating the use of this one-way valve will know what to look out for. One-way speaking valves like this can be used perfectly safely early in the patient's journey with a new tracheostomy. They can help the benefits of laryngeal rehabilitation, an early return to speaking, eating, drinking, and an improvement in the patient's coughing and swallowing, all of which can help liberate them from the ventilator and help to get the tracheostomy tube out sooner. However, we've got to be really careful with these. We can use them if we're all trained, we all talk to each other, and we all know what we're doing. It's essential that they're used with the cuff deflated or a tracheostomy tube without a cuff. Thanks for listening and I hope you found that useful.